Hi, it's API Days Helsinki here again, and now I have Jaap Brasser, developer advocate from Rubrik, and before I let him loose on the SDK development, what you, have you learned or done differently this spring with all the remote work and other relationships? Okay, well, thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I had the advantage that I was already a remote employee before uh, before this whole crisis started. But uh, I think what I've learned is that staying in touch and uh, more frequently using video communications, both uh, in my private life and my work life, has, uh, has been very beneficial to stay in touch with people. And on the work side of things, being able to see a person and see their body language helps a lot with clear com communications. Uh, the other thing uh, I've noticed is having good equipment, having a decent webcam, a, a decent uh, work from home setup where you can focus and uh, actually get your work done uh, has been very beneficial uh, for me. Yes, and that just proves the point of good tools, which kind of leads us to the good SDKs, doesn't it? Yeah. So just tell us what you have learned. All right. So this was uh, the, the feeling I got when I got started developing SDKs. Uh, my background is that I used to be an infrastructure engineer, so SDKs are a bit of a, 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 bit of a new field uh, for me when I got, uh, got started with it. A um, little bit about myself. So uh, I'm Jaap, uh, I'm a developer advocate at Rubik, uh, very much into cloud automation, scripting, and also cute furry animals from Australia called quackas. So what we'll be talking about today is uh, we'll talk, uh, I'll first give a brief introduction to the Rubik APIs so we know what, uh, what we're working with, what kind of goal we have here. Uh, then some of the challenges that I, uh, I ran into as I was developing the SDKs and uh, making the plans and leading, leading the team effort to actually uh, to actually build and solve issues, and then uh, the lessons learned uh, from that. And at the end, I have uh, time for questions as well. So at Rubik, uh, we're a cloud data management company. So our API uh, is uh, a part of our product. Actually, everything that we can do within the Rubik uh, uh, GUI can uh, can be done through the API. So we are uh, we are our biggest API consumer ourselves. So the things we can do with it is backup, restore, uh, cloud data management. Uh, think of this disaster recovery scenarios, test dev, and integration into uh, CI/CD pipelines. So the challenges that uh, we had is that uh, APIs are actually relatively new in the in the data in the data management uh, sphere so most of our uh, uh, most uh, similar products they they have legacy tools or executables or they, they've built out custom modules or integrations in order to uh, in order to interact with these products and there's a lot of uh, GUIs out there that you need to use in order to uh, to get your work done and I've been in IT for quite some time, and for me, that seems a bit uh, seemed a bit counterproductive to have to switch from one GUI to the other. And uh, the challenge we have there is also that a lot of the our, our typical end users they they don't have an understanding of what what an API is or what kind of benefit uh, this uh, this can bring to to their organization. So as I already mentioned, we're built up uh, to be API first. So everything, uh, everything that we can do with our product is either exposed as an, uh, as an internal or an, uh, or an external uh, API call. And the cool thing about it is that if you, use, uh, if you use Chrome with the developer tools, you can just press F12 and you can see exactly what is happening. So it's, uh, uh, if you have a bit of a scripting or developer background, uh, it can be very easy to see what's going on and to actually reconstruct a workflow just by looking at the API calls that are uh, 
that are fired off in the background. Um, I already mentioned internal endpoints are uh, are a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we've uh, we've made a, a distinction between internal and uh, V1 and V2 endpoints. And the biggest distinction is that the internal ones they can they can still fluctuate. So that's something that uh, a model we want to step away from because uh, it's not uh, it's not helpful for integrations that uh, an endpoint might change or it might take a different payload or even the name or location of the endpoint might change. Uh, the good thing is that everything is defined as an open API spec, so it's it gets very easy to discover and also to automatically generate documentation based on based on your endpoints. So that was a bit of the background. So now let's get up, get to the goal and what we were uh, what we were actually trying to uh, trying to get to. So. Working with APIs and doing the web calls, uh, it is something that is a very developer, uh, very developer focused. And since we're in the uh, in the data management sphere, not not all of our end users uh, might be very well versed with uh, directly uh, consuming APIs. So, because we want to be able to uh, to cater to our different uh, our different end users, uh, we we want to simplify the API interaction. And one of the things we uh, we do is we we take the structured output that we get uh, that we get from uh, from our API end, API endpoints, and uh, we present that in a way that uh, makes sense for the language. So we have a couple of different uh, different languages. So if you take, for example, uh, this is my uh, my uh, my scripting language of choice, PowerShell. Everything that comes uh, comes out of our PowerShell SDK is actually going to be a PowerShell custom object, so we can do sorting and uh, work with it uh, directly. And because of that, because we create all these functions for for the different languages, there's no more direct API calls, and this uh, simplifies the interaction because you're still utilizing the API, but you're no longer uh, you're no longer uh, performing the calls manually. And the last step is then also uh, making sure that we have uh, proper session management. So uh, normally, when you uh, when you authenticate, you need to specify the the bearer token uh, for every interaction, and we've uh, abstracted that away. Make sure that uh, that our end users can just uh, execute a function and they get the result back in a in a simple simplified way. So I mentioned there's different uh, there's different SDKs out there. So uh, currently we have uh, three languages covered. So we have Python, we have PowerShell, and we have uh, we have GoLang. Uh, there's more on the roadmap, but we're we're taking it uh, one language uh, one language at a time. And to give you an idea of where we're coming from, so whenever we're uh, performing uh, performing a query. Uh, we get back a big JSON object. So this might be uh, might be very uh, uh, very useful for uh, for a developer that wants to wants to build uh, wants to build a service on top of our product. But it's not uh, it's not a very user friendly way of uh, presenting the data. So in the next example, we have uh, what this would look like when we're uh, when we're using PowerShell. So as you can see here, we get the, exactly the same output as we got from uh, in, in the previous screenshot. But now we have a very simple, uh, we have a very simple command. It's just get rubric VM. So uh, our product rubric, it's protecting a VM. We want to know some of the basic information about this. And if we query this, uh, we specify a name. This will be, uh, this will be part of, uh, of the call to the API endpoint. And then the information, the JSON information, is uh, is converted into PowerShell uh, PowerShell custom object. So we have a nice structured output. And uh, depending on the persona that we're targeting, in this in this case, we're targeting uh, backup administrators or uh, DevOps engineers that don't want to work directly with our API. And then they can use this uh, uh, they can use this SDK instead. And we also provide uh, verbose information to see what kind of 
what what kind of queries are actually executed. This is of course optional. You have to you have to set a switch for this to to get this kind of output. But using this, it, you can also use it for discovery to see what kind of what kind of queries needs to be executed in order to get this data back. So what we've uh, what we've done here is uh, by creating these SDKs, it uh, it makes it simpler to also update because whenever there's uh, whenever there's going to be changes to our API endpoints, uh, whether their uh, their path might change, the location might change, there might be new parameters, or in case of a, a post or patch uh, 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 calls to the endpoint, the body uh, the body might change. And uh, in that sense, having having an SDK that takes that uh, that abstracts those API calls away makes it a lot easier to build uh, to build tooling on top uh, of those SDKs. Um, the uh, the second thing we've done we've we've turned this into a sort of a feedback loop. So uh, based on the tools that are built on top of the SDKs. We also get feedback either from uh, from customers, partners, but also from internal employees. Like we we have this tooling now, uh, we want to use the SDK for that, but uh, functionality A might be missing. Or when we get this output back, why why is it in this format? Or it seems uh, it, uh, it seems that this could be done in an easier way. So we we take this feedback uh, that we get from our tool developers, from our customers, from our, from our engineers. And we feed it back into, uh, into the work we're doing on the SDK. And, and when I say the work we do, um, of course, everything we do is, uh, is on GitHub. So the, the workflow we follow whenever there's a suggestion or a bug, anything is just filed as a GitHub issue and we'll, uh, we'll take it, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up from there. So, because we place everything on GitHub, it's of course all uh, it's all open source. Uh, one of the things that was definitely missing when uh, when I started on uh, one of the refactors of uh, of our biggest uh, biggest SDK was that there there were some unit tests. But if we're if we're talking about code co coverage, I think we were at two or three percent code coverage, and. Um, and I think that makes it quite hard for uh, for both us um, as uh, as developers on this SDK uh, to to make changes because this code might have been around for five years already um, if it's not uh, if it's not well documented and that's actually the next <laughs> the next point if it's not well documented and there's no unit test then if you change something is this going to break it what is going to uh, what what is going to happen. So these have been two, uh, two focus points for us to make sure that whatever was already developed that didn't have unit tests, we, we created unit tests, uh, we, built, uh, we built a CI CD pipeline on top of it. Uh, we make sure that all the different platforms that we target with our, uh, with our SDKs are covered and the unit tests are run against all the different, uh, different platforms. And then the but I guess it depends who you ask, but uh, work, work, uh, work on the documentation, get it up to date by understanding what kind of, um, uh, what, what kind of functionality a, a function was providing. So some of the challenges that we, uh, that we actually get into, one of the things was, uh, uh, was team enablement because not everyone. Uh, I, I've already shown that there were different. Uh, there, we, we've been working with different languages, different uh, uh, different tools. Not everyone uh, in the team might be as well versed as the other in um, using PowerShell or uh, setting up a CI/CD pipeline. Of course, you don't set those up on a daily basis, but uh, everyone working on the product needs to have uh, some level of understanding of. What is going on in that pipeline in order to to be successful and to be a to be a, cont a contributor? Uh, the second challenge was uh, like managing what what is coming in and how uh, how we fit this into the scope of the project. So our project was 
do a major refactor of uh, uh, of this SDK and make sure it's completely aligned with the latest uh, and greatest functionality that's out there, which is something that is already not easy by itself. But if you take into account that the moment you start working on an open source project and there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of, a lot of issues you're creating and working to and pull requests, the moment we started doing that, we also saw a massive influx uh, from external users that were using our SDKs they saw there was a lot of activity going on on this repository and because of that they started submitting their own uh, their own issues so at the start uh, it it was a bit overwhelming but uh, we, we managed to uh, to find a good workflow and to uh, to plan accordingly uh, because initially uh, we we scoped it very tight because yeah eternal optimists always so uh, but once we started taking into account uh, that a lot of issues might be coming out of the work we were doing, uh, we got a better, uh, better grip on the scope there. And that also brings us to uh, bugs in the APIs, because if you're working, uh, uh, working on developing an SDK, uh, uh, you start taking a very close look at what kind of output is being generated uh, from uh, from our API endpoints, and 99% of the times the output is as expected. But sometimes there can also be bugs in APIs, and that's actually uh, that's actually a nice thing because because we're diving so deep, we're able to to feed that uh, feedback back into uh, the engineering teams of the SDK and uh, of the API endpoints. I mean, and we use the the, the time that we spent developing our, uh, our SDKs to also improve our API. And that has led to uh, new API versions and bug fixes in, uh, in existing APIs. And then we get to uh, security. So one of, the, one of the questions we get, because uh, we're working with data management, so your backup data is quite quite essential uh, essential data you don't want uh, uh, you don't want to compromise the security of that uh, well our, our platform is uh, of course completely secure but the moment you open source an SDK uh, there might be a possibility of uh, a malicious uh, uh, a malicious contributor that uh, that uses the fact that it's open source to get uh, to get malicious code into the SDK that might compromise a system. Well, the, we, we've taken a number of steps there to ensure that uh, we don't get into, uh, into that uh, specific scenario. Of course, we have the manual reviews of, co uh, of code, but we've also created some automated, uh, automated systems that we can, we can run against every PR to ensure um, and by PR, I mean uh, for every pull request, uh, to ensure that there there are, is no malicious code, there's no obfuscation going on, there's no data being dumped to external uh, to external IP addresses. Some of the some of the basics, uh, and the other part is of course also making sure that your CI/CD pipelines are hardened, and there's no way that a malicious uh, PR can expose your secrets. And in order to do that, uh, we've used a lot of automation and uh, getting, using that automation allowed us to create a, 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 create a faster way of working and also making it more predictable and uh, easier to document because once you've documented how the automation works, uh, you don't have to do a lot of explaining uh, aside from that. And one of the things we struggled with that uh, uh, that wasn't very clearly defined before we started working on uh, our SDKs was what kind of what kind of branching strategies do we want to use? Well, that turned out to be relatively simple to uh, to solve. But then also uh, working with releases, like what kind of uh, what kind of release schedule do we want? What kind of cadence do we uh, do we expect there? And what kind of uh, what kind of support? Uh, what kind of support can we tie to the different releases that are uh, that are coming out? 
So going over to lessons learned. Uh, the big, uh, the, the big one, the, the one I also put on number one, is making sure that we uh, we have very clear coding and contribution standards, because I think it's uh, very frustrating for uh, for potential contributors or people that, uh, that that run into issues and raise an issue uh, if it's just declined or if we have to go back and forth to uh, to get. Uh, to get to a point where we can actually accept this code or we can actually start working on the issue. So by creating contribution uh, contribution guides, um, uh, in our case on GitHub, we, we make it very clear what we what we expect of pull requests. Uh, whenever you uh, file a bug report, we just have a template there. So it becomes, uh, it becomes very clear that what kind of steps uh, need to be taken. So it makes it easier for the contributors. It also makes it easier for uh, the people approving and merging, uh, merging the PRs. Uh, secondly, enforcing unit tests, because we came from, uh, from a time where we didn't have any unit tests. So having no unit tests was obviously not the scenario we want to be in. So whenever there's new, uh, new code coming in, uh, we enforce unit tests. And, uh, we also take the time for uh, new contributors to uh, to help them out, to to give them the tools they need, so they know how to actually create unit tests. Because not not everyone might be uh, might be as familiar with that. Um, so that's that's the enabling part of uh, things. Um, we spend a lot of time and energy uh, on integrating the different the different tools and making sure that we have the pipelines. Uh, make the pipelines available and make sure they work exactly as expected, make sure it's documented so everyone uh, everyone involved knows uh, what is going to happen if they click merge PR request or whenever a PR uh, is filed. And one thing we grossly underestimated at the start was the issues and uh, contributions. It takes a lot of time, especially if you're working on an active open source project, there's going to be a lot of, uh, in our case, there, there's going to be a lot of issues and pull requests coming out from the community. And we, we could have done a better job there <laughs> estimating how much would come out of that. But I guess that's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good kind of problem to have, having a lot of contributions from the community. So I, uh, I, I find this quite, uh, quite positive. And the last one is a bit of a point of contention. Do not automate everything. Uh, obviously, automating uh, uh, automation can, can be a big uh, benefit. Uh, but what we've uh, what we've noticed that in some cases, uh, not using automation and using uh, using a manual process to put together uh, to put together our SDKs is actually uh, a better approach. And uh, an example is we could use our Open API spec to just generate all the all the commandlets and all the uh, all the functions that we need. But by doing so, uh, it's it gets a lot harder to use, and that that all ties back to what kind of audience are you targeting? And uh, our mindset was that uh, we build our SDKs for people that are not developers. We expect our developers to just talk directly to the API endpoints, use the documentation available there. And for our SDKs, we wanted to provide uh, a more user-friendly experience that can be used in line from any kind of shell or any kind of uh, any kind of command prompt, and with that uh, we reached uh, we reached the end. So, if you have any questions, I'll be sticking around for a while. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jaap. And yes, I have some questions. I'm sure the audience would also like to hear. So. Um, so it seems that your SDK is actually more of a command line interface type of an SDK. It uh, de de depends on which, uh, which SDK. Uh, so our Golang is ob obviously more focused on developers, mm. but our PowerShell SDK is more of a, of a command oh, yeah. line. Uh, yeah. Command line. Yeah. Okay. And 
did you kind of what kind of process did you have there to decide exactly those languages and and those audiences and and kind of like it seems that you more or less thought of this um first as an internal development or, or like for yourself and and guided by you but then it turned into like from internal api to an open api kind of situation but with sdk so have you had you uh considered to kind of just open up the roadmap or the problem or the the kind of first very mvp set of code to the community and just let them do the development was that an option for you um so our uh, actually the uh, our first sdk was uh, was our powershell sdk and that mm -hmm. was actually the development on that was started a couple of years because before i joined uh, i joined okay. Lubick. so we already had uh, that one out there um and the other sdk so python and golang it's it, it, it was actually driven by the kind of uh, the, the kind of tools we wanted to build on top uh, on top of that. So in the case of uh, in case of uh, the Python uh, SDK, we wanted to build uh, we want to build uh, uh, tooling on top of using uh, using Ansible. And in the case of GoLang, uh, we use it as the basis for our Terraform provider. So that's how we that's how we got to those languages and mm. that's also how we go to map future uh, future languages based on the the kind of integrations we want to uh, we want to build on top of that okay and <clears throat> just last question about how would you say that like uh, if you'd made those testing and and uh, basically other guidelines to contribute were they were are the same con uh, contribution guidelines and test guidelines working for your own internal developers and for the community, or do you have to kind of make extra set steps for the externals? Um, so I, I would say we're more strict for our internal people. So for <laughs> our internal people, if they don't have uh, if they don't have unit tests, then then we're uh, then we're just no we will not accept this yeah. but if it's a if it's a community uh, a community contribution uh it's it's a two-step process either we say uh, do you want us to help do you want us to provide you the resources uh, there's there's even been cases where i've just jumped on the zoom call with uh with one of our contributors and just talked them through the process because they were really interested in learning how to mm. uh how to create those unit tests and how to uh, how unit testing actually worked in that specific yeah i was going to ask <laughs> i yeah. was going to ask about that because it, uh, in my experience with a very kind of similar situation uh once upon a time uh, or a couple of uh cases it was actually a very big jump to a lot of people to that world of unit testing and even yeah. writing their actual code so that it was unit testable yes which is <clears throat> a very easy thing to not uh yeah yeah we actually <laughs> we, we actually ended up rewriting some parts of our uh, of our code because yeah. it was not unit testable so <laughs> it also depends on the unit testing framework you you use so, so some of the code we had to like rewrite and create internal private functions that would be unit testable and mm. those kind of uh, those kind of considerations but I really liked like your point that it also made you aware of all the problems you might have in your API because it's kind of writing test code for the API and that's that's a huge bonus for you. Hey, thank you. This was a really interesting case you had here and it was really good to hear about. I'm sure everybody else is interested in it too. So thank you, Jaap, for joining us in Helsinki virtually. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much, and I hope to be there in person next uh, next time. That would be great. <laughs>